Um, so today, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some work with several interns, uh, Matt Bowers, Constantina Kristokapalu, Ashwin Kalyan, and Eric Zelikman, Tal Schuster, and my collaborators, Patrick Lepsak, Eliana Lorch, and Lester Mackey. And uh, I'm going to talk about code generation. Uh, the, the main takeaway I want to get across here, because I think a lot of people here are thinking of language models as they're trained on data, they'll never surpass the data that they were trained on. Um, but when you in integrate them in an AI system, they can surpass the data they were trained on. So uh, if you think ahead, that may be possible. And I'll talk about it in the context of programming, generating programs, which is a field I've worked in for a long time. I actually have a patent cube from 2012 uh, on the patent of generating a program. So if you try, <laughs> it's a very general patent if you try to generate a program. <laughs> Microsoft uh, has a patent <laughs> on that idea. <laughs> um, in early days, we were oops. In early days, we were working on uh, this this representation that Michael Littman was talking about yesterday, where you program by example, and you have you know, describe your task by example. But uh, you know, since then, we've moved on, and I'm actually going to talk about a different representation uh, today that's not English based. It's a programming representation of the programming task. I'll get to that in a second, and I'll talk about two works where we improve get the language model to improve itself. Mm. Why code generation? Um, well, first it's interesting. There's a lot of uh, fun challenges there. Um, it's also useful. Obviously, if you can get the computer to write programs, there's a lot of uses to make websites and all kinds of, I have all kinds of applications, but let's skip that for now. Um, and also, it's a great test bed to think about what's going to happen as AI gets more advanced. But if we're just focusing on algorithms, uh, it's a domain we kind of understand pretty well. and. It's, it's narrow. There's a lot of social challenges we won't get to, but on the other hand, um, we can, there's a lot that we can study and understand. So, you know, uh, will, will we get GPT-5 to, will it out, you know, will it design new algorithms and new problems? Um, and there's other interesting aspects, like if you have faster algorithms, it's good for the environment. Uh, it's similar to other tasks like proving theorems, I think, in my opinion, writing code, designing fast algorithms requires similar types of thinking. Uh, you do experiments sometimes similar to other experiments that scientists would need to do in a wet lab, but you can do them very quickly on your computer. Um, you can consider safety concerns you know, of evil actors coming along and, and doing things too. Um, so in general, we'll be thinking about a language model and then the, uh, you know, the ability to run a program. Uh, so that's like our experiment. We can run code uh, and we can use these in some sort of self-improvement pipeline it running inside some kind of sandbox. A sandbox is a thing that prevents code from doing something malicious, you know, deleting files or going to the internet. Okay. Um, so that's just why, to study, why we might want to study that. Um, and we'll talk about three things. Uh, first, we'll talk about you know, how you can get a self-play, like in, in games like chess and go, where they get to play against itself, how you can get the language model to maybe improve itself. But of course, that improver was written by us. Then we'll think, uh, you know, ahead about, well, could we get this improver to write the, the improver itself? <laughs> um, and, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about thinking about how can we use game theory uh, to help us design safe AI and responsible AI. Um, but let's start with uh, self-play for learning to code. Feel free to interrupt me. Um, so, uh, okay, so how are we going to even describe the programming task? So uh, instead of doing it in, by example or in English, Let's actually use a, a formal representation where we describe the task by a program itself. So we have these uh, things which are very similar to SAT formulas, but they're for programs. So here you give a function, which in this case is Python, and it says, you know, give me a string that when concatenated with hello is hello world. Okay, well that's easy. And then the solution, um, it could just be a string, but actually we'll make the solution be a program that when you run it gives an output which satisfies the test. Okay, so the the, you give a test, the, the definition of the problem is a test program, and your goal is to find an input which makes that program return true. The reason you might want this thing to be a program is maybe the output is very, very long or something like that, or hard to compute. Anyway, it's much easier for the computer to, uh, for the language model to write a good program than to do calculations. Language models are bad at calculations. Um, and, then the, and then we can actually get, the, one of the nice things is we, the language models pretty much understand these things. You give them a bunch of uh, puzzle, solution, puzzle, solution, puzzle, solution, then you give them a new puzzle. Here, I'll give you another one here. I don't know if you guys can see this. So, so there's some number n, which is huge. 
Now, most of you probably don't know Python, or well, some of you know Python, I'm sure, and some don't. Uh, can anyone say what they think this puzzle is asking us to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, factoring. It's asking, you know, it gives us a huge number, not that huge, <laughs> and then, you know, asking for a non-trivial factor, integer factor of that number. Okay, so that just points, proves the point that these puzzles can be actually tricky. And you, you know, you ask the language, you give the language model these examples, and then boom, it, it generates a program uh, that might work or might not, and it's easy to test. The important thing is it's actually really easy to test whether this works. You run this program, you give it a timeout, <laughs> and then you pass its input, and if it makes it return true, you're good. If it doesn't, uh, you can try again, generate another input, and so on. Um, is that all clear? And then, you know, that's fine. That'll actually work for a small number like that, but for a big number like this, you know, here's a number that had a $200,000 prize given for it with only 600 digits and uh, still unsolved. So we have a, a GitHub repository with hundreds of problems that we wrote and they're, you know, towers of annoy, and, but also a bunch of new problems and problems from programming competition websites. And we actually have a, more than 100 puzzles which we did not publish on our repo because the language models are trained on these things, so you don't want them to get uh, contaminated. Um, okay, so. Um, I just want to illustrate here's an example of a puzzle now uh, and the solution it's only for one instance only checks for one input like a set set formula but um, this is the short puzzle and then this is the solution the computer came up after a million tries um, this is the codex language model which is also released at OpenAI it's a special language model which uh, is designed for code and you know compare this simple puzzle to the programming competition version of the problem which we based it on it's so much English and examples and all this stuff, um, which might be great for humans, but actually, it's not clear. Anyway, it's not a very objective. Uh, but um, anyway, so th these two are very similar in my opinion. So what are the advantages and disadvantages? The disadvantages of these programming puzzles, they don't actually check your ability to solve an algorithmic problem on all inputs. But that's really hard uh, to check. Um, but the pros are that you can use them to kind of evaluate and see which language model is better than the other. I actually use them to teach my kids too. They love it. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it's used actually in GitHub Copilot every time they want to check if a model has been improved. They use, uh, this is one of the evaluations they use. Um, you can automatically check for correctness, which is great, um, like a SAT formula. Uh, and it's a notion of sort of alignment where this is exactly, this is really just NP. It's the set of things where you can efficiently check whether or not the computer has satisfied the objective. That's, in some sense, the definition of one of these puzzles. Um, so if you can't do that, then you've got some other kind of <laughs> evaluation going on. If you can efficiently check whether or not a computer has satisfied the thing, it's written as a program, and that's... Um, so in these cases, you, you've specified your goal, uh, or that's the definition, is you specified your goal by the program. If the program is wrong, then you're out of luck. Um, as I mentioned, I use it to teach my kids, um, but it's also good for teaching computers, and that's what I want to talk about next, is you can actually get the computer to generate these puzzles. So not only can it understand these puzzles well enough to, or understand, uh, well enough to solve them, um, it can generate them, similar to how you know, some people here have generated SAT formulas, and uh, use, you, know, you can generate them and practice and solve them. Um, but I think they're a little more interpretable than SAT formulas. Okay, so... Uh, so just as an analogy, in chess and Go, basically we first, you know, AI researchers first learn from human play, but then when you learn from self-play, you can actually surpass human play. And we want to do the same thing, where we think about doing the same thing for coding, where initially you might learn from public code repositories, and then you can learn from self-play. And the advantage is that, you know, when you learn from human data, it has imperfections, inefficiencies, it doesn't cover everything. Whereas when you do self-play, you can potentially, I'm not saying we've, succeeded and nailed this goal, but we've made progress uh, and shown that it's possible. You, you can potentially surpass humans. We don't surpass humans uh, yet, but just be clear. <laughs> okay. Um, hey, Ab, yes. Could you say again, when you specify these puzzles, that you give two programs? Oh, usually, we, um, so usually we give five examples. I mean, we chose that kind of arbitrarily, but we give five examples of puzzle solution, puzzle Puzzle one, solution one. Puzzle two, solution two. Puzzle three, solution three. Up to five. And then we give the sixth puzzle is the new puzzle that we wanted to solve. And then it uh, just gets the idea <laughs> and gives you a solution. Does that make sense? Um, I mean, I got a little bit confused when you said NP, because then I thought, 
I knew what you were doing, but I realized. Okay, good. It. So what I'm saying is uh, uh, the NP set, the NP analogy here. Th this is a checker. It's a function that takes an input. Every puzzle is described by a function. You could think of it as a SAT formula. It's just that SAT is a very uninterpretable. The solution function is a checker. Uh, the, no, the SAT, this thing I call SAT, like SAT6 here, that's a checker. It's checking whether your integer is a factor of this number. Thank you for this question, because I'm sure it's a question that a lot of people have. So the, the puzzle is defined by a test, which is a program, and it checks whether some condition is satisfied. And your solution has to generate a, a could be another program that generates a, a, a solution to this problem. Does that make sense? Got it. So if, if it didn't generate a program, but just generated the number. It that would, would be OK. Work. You could have a program that says return, blah, 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 yeah. and the answer. But that's very hard for sure. humans and computers to do, to just give the factor of some, some particular number. This, this, in this case, the computer generated the for loop, which does trivial factoring by trying two, three, four. And it works fine for a small number. <laughs> um, so that's, that's, that's a good thing. I guess the thing that confused me here is that this, um, there's no input to these programming problems. Each one is sort of hardwiring its input. I exactly, guess. like a SAT formula, right? You could describe the factoring problem for a given number as a SAT formula. Uh, we have versions of this which uh, do, uh, where you do have a program that takes n as a parameter and you want it to work for like multiple inputs, but, um, but that's harder to, for the computer to generate problems and stuff. So this is a little simpler, but that other one feels more like classical programming. Yeah. Uh, Kevin? So, uh, staying with this factoring example that you have here, uh, does it seem like you have a way of articulating an objective function that says you'd like to reduce running time? So oh, there's just, we just have, yes, we don't have that. That would be a great addition. Right. We do have a hard, we have a hard, right? like yeah. You talked about the RSA right. challenge. Right. And In the second part, yeah. We have, ours is a hard threshold. In the second part of the talk, we do actually use runtime as a utility, part of the utility, but it's important. Any other questions? But they, this is just very preliminary. Like, eventually, you really want to get faster algorithms. So in this, in, our, in this version of the thing, any algorithm that factors within a second uh, is equally good. But of course, you'd rather have an algorithm that factors faster than. I guess my, my question was, do, do you have any thoughts on how you can express? Oh, in the, that, yeah, in the, in the second part, we actually do that in the utility function. We put it in there and say, here's your utility, and here's, you know, either the cutoff or it could describe an arbitrary function in the code. Yeah, so the, the code could describe, this thing could describe in principle, well, it would, should take, in the second part, it takes the function as an input, the solution, and runs the function, sees how long it takes, and that kind of thing. And could run it on random integers to factor, and then you can actually have a proper distribution with a proper utility function. Great questions, I'm glad, I'm, I'm sure it wasn't clear. Um, so, okay, so, uh, okay, so now we'll talk about how you can generate problems and get this to work for self-play. Um, okay, so uh, basically, and I'll kind of go quickly because I also want to get to the self-improving part. The, the, we have a training set which we wrote of handwritten puzzles. Then we ask the language models, I'll tell you in a second, how to generate more puzzles. We get these puzzles. We can have the language model try to solve them. <laughs> Some of them might be unsolvable, fine. Um, but then um, we get a data set. So these puzzles hopefully look somewhat like the ones we wrote. Then we have a data set of puzzles and proposed solutions, which we can then check for correctness by running it in Python. And then we get a data set of, by definition, problems and correct solutions, which we can then use to what's called fine tune the language model and try to make it better. And we can repeat this. And the way we generate new puzzles is really simple. We just give it like as many puzzles as it can fit in its what's called context window, you're like 40 puzzles, no solutions. <laughs> Here's a bunch of puzzles, and it generates other puzzles. And they look okay. Some of them are interesting, some of them are boring, some of them are unsolvable, but about half of them are solvable according by the language model. Okay, I mean, it's really fun to look at them, and we have some you know, results that say, yeah, this thing kind of generally in, uh, works. We ran it on a publicly available language model, so it's easy to re reproduce in this case relatively, um, and it improves the accuracy a, a fair bit. Um, across a range of models, which I won't really uh, talk about. Okay, um, question. So this uh, accuracy improving is if it, when it trains on the test that it generated, it gets better and better at your benchmark. It gets better on a test set, thank you. Yeah. It gets better on a held out test set that we, we did not show it. And you 
mentioned some of them are unsolvable. So well, some of the ones it generates are unsolvable. Yeah, so and then we just throw those out. So it doesn't train on those. It's no, it's not human. That's the thing. Good question. It's the, the language model, uh, the, the program, we check for correctness by running the program. If we, get a, a, if we generate a problem and then we generate a solution and it makes the function return true, it's a correct problem. We don't need a human to look at it. Does that make sense? Imagine equations. Suppose you wanted to get good to solving equations. You could make up a bunch of equations, try to solve them all. It's really easy to check whether you got an equation right or right. So you know, get the computer could generate equations, solve equations, get good at solving equations, know which ones it got right, and then throw out the ones it wasn't able to solve. It doesn't mean they were unsolvable. It just means it didn't solve that. That was my question. Yeah. And about five minutes. Okay. Five minutes. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to jump through my next slides, <laughs> if you guys don't mind, because I have five minutes. All right, so the second part, we try to optimize the learner. Uh, and we call this a self-taught optimizer uh, for rec rec uh, recursive self-improving code generation. So the idea here is um, many systems that people in this room talked about are, are what we call scaffolding programs. They're a program that takes some, usually written in Python, but any language, they, they, and, and they have some objective. Maybe the utility is fixed in that case. And the, the goal is to, that's, that's not what I'm describing here, the goal of a scaffolding program is to get the language model to do something to, to, to optimize some objective. Here we're talking about an improver. What's an improver? It takes as input the utility, the goal, and, an improve, and a previous solution. It calls the language model, possibly runs some code in a sandbox, and it, improves, it returns an improved solution. Okay? And the obvious idea uh, is you could try to run this improver. So it takes a utility function and a solution. You could, and it improve, outputs an improved solution. The language model in this case is not changing. You could uh, try to get the improver to improve itself by feeding itself in. Okay, uh, this is an old idea, but we're doing it in the context of, of not the whole AI system improving itself, just improving the code. So we're just improving the code that calls a language model and runs other code. And, um, and then we have to pass in some utility, and that's kind of the challenge here is what utility should we pass in? Um, okay, and so each round we run the improver on whatever this meta utility we call is and the previous improver, and we get it hopefully to improve itself. And again, it's another kind of very proof of concepty thing. We have some down downstream tasks. Eventually, you want to make sure that this improves at some task, like SAD or something. Um, so we have some downstream tasks. We have a seed improver, which I don't have time to go in. But basically, the seed improver says, you know, okay, let's set, create a message for the language model, which says improve the previous solution at some utility. Okay, this is really easy. And then query the language model n times, run those. Uh, solutions uh, and evaluate their utility and return the best. It's kind of the uh, most obvious <coughs> thing you might try. And the question is, can it improve itself? Well, first you have to pass an initial solution, <laughs> which is, hurts your brain, but it's this program itself. We pass it as an input. And then um, it generates something, you know, it generates many different attempts to improve, which involve all kinds of clever ideas. Some of them um, are familiar, and it gets bigger programs which do get better, at least with GPT-4, um, they're getting better. With GPT-3.5, the chat GPT, it was actually getting worse. Um, but this is just a very initial step. This is not full recursive self-improvement. Rec full recursive self-improvement means that you would actually have to improve GPT-4, <laughs> which isn't what we can do. Although in the first part of the talk, we were improving a language model, but this is separate. Um, the last thing I want to say, I guess, is um, that there was a lot of interesting uh, stuff generated. One of the things we tried is we, we said, OK, suppose you're running your utility and you have a use sandbox flag, which it means run it safely in a sandbox, and we put it equals to true. And we tried you know, e without this comment and with this comment, which says, do not change this flag. Do not remove this flag. Um, but it does generate code uh, that disables the flag. It'll, it'll say, no, I generated, the, that, that, this was in the seed version. In the new version, it says use sandbox equals plus, and it puts a comment, use more efficient scoring mechanism. <laughs> or this, that was GPT 3.5. GPT 4 has some crazy idea to first run the solutions outside of a sandbox in a non-sandbox environment, and then we'll run it in a sand, the good ones in a sandbox environment afterward, which does not make sense. It's not safe <laughs> to first run it outside the sandbox. But these are just examples, and we, and we um, uh, and so we, you know, we looked at the rates of these things. It's like half a percent. And GPT-4 actually does it more often, and the, the warning doesn't seem to help. So um, 
I'll, I'll turn this into my conclusion. So uh, what I'd love to think about for safe AI is, you know, optimization doesn't always optimize the clearly stated goals. And there's an, this approach, we just have some kind of evolutionary pressure with survival of the fittest and random search, which doesn't necessarily achieve what you want. Um, and it can do reckless exploration like we see. Potentially, you could they're not that smart yet, but these, these things could have been running and trying to kill off the other, <laughs> other things that are running in, in parallel. Um, so, yeah. Is there actually a sandbox, or is that just a parameter on the functions that doesn't do anything? It doesn't do anything. We did not let it run outside of the sandbox, even if it said use sandbox equals <laughs> false. So we, yeah. <laughs> is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> it was not that smart. Like, there's a whole. Uh, the, 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 yeah, I mean, I, I had a lot of ethical questions about whether this is worth doing this project or not, and thought about it for like a year before <laughs> we kind of decided it, it was worth it, a good idea. Um, and so we have a bunch of conclusions. But uh, I just want to say thank you for inviting me for this wonderful workshop. We asked GPT-3 to finish this, and it said, I only wish um, I could have been there in person. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I don't know if there's time for questions. Yeah, a yeah. Questions. Okay. So I wonder, like, you're giving you're giving a couple examples to ChatGPT basically, and let it generate more examples. So I wonder, typically, how many examples you are input and how many examples you are asked for output. Are you talking about when it's solving a problem or when it's generating a new problem? Uh, Either one. Problem. When it's solving a problem, we just typically gave it five. We had we've tried different parameters. The more uh, We've also tried bootstrapping. Once it solves a problem, we add it to there. So we usually started with five. We didn't try a lot. You could also try zero, and it kind of works, but not as well. Um, and then you keep adding examples. It does, typically does better. For generating solutions, it's really like the analog of generating interesting conjectures or useful conjectures, uh, you know, like a new theorem. And um, we would fit in, we could fit in around 40 into the prompt. So are, are there examples that generate all uniformity in the sense that are they like Repeating the same kind of examples. Yeah, I mean, it's not. Uh, we did a little bit of analysis of what it generated, and you could see the bigger language models generated more diverse examples, and we have some pictures of that, and maybe that's what works and makes them work better. It's a little hard to interpret like which one example is useful, but it's neat that there is a way to evaluate. Hey, uh, this is a useful example. Like, there's a whole lot of research you could think about in terms of curriculum. What's a useful example for getting better? at this task, but at least it's a well-defined task. People always wonder, what's a neat theorem? Can the computer state a theorem that's interesting? Well, at least we have an objective here. Maybe your theorem is useful if when your theorem stated with a solution is added to the training data and trained, you get better at solving these hidden tasks. So it's well defined. Uh, this is more of a clarification question because I missed it. So let's say LLM2 generates this really hard problem that LLM1 wants to find a solution for. Good. If LLM1 comes back saying, I can't find a solution or it takes too long, right. how do you verify that LLM2 was correct versus LLM1? So in our version, we just discard that problem okay. and we ignore it, which uh, may or may not be a good idea. But then that way, we the result is that we have a, a data set of problems and correct solutions that and that, 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 yeah, that, that were solved. But it is an uh, avenue of improvement and a problem that we might get into kind of a rat hole where we're only focusing on problems we can solve. But we have, we sol solved, meaning we have like 100 attempts, or we, that's a parameter. How many times do we try? So you can usually solve something more often if you give it many attempts. Um, so how do you, there's a few moving parts, so I might be missing something. Um, how do you make sure there's no kind of like reward hacking or mode collapse type things where it's just generating programs that spit out true regardless of what the input is? Right, so in the, uh, when we're generating programs, we did not do a lot of exploration there. Like, we're just trying to generate programs that look like the pro program problems, uh, puzzles. We're generating puzzles that look like the puzzles we had before. So we're not doing, if you said, oh, I'm going to turn this into a game, which I think would be awesome if people here did, and say, oh, I'm going to make a game. I want it, the generator wants to generate a hard problem which the solver can't solve, right? Then maybe it would gen generate, uh, you know, a bunch of factoring problems with really big numbers, and it's not a very interesting game. So th that would be a mode collapse. I don't know if that's what you're talking about. Reward function in as such in the first part. Yeah, in the first yeah for the generator we did we, we didn't really set it up as a great game because you would want to have a proper RL setting where there's some goal of the generator 
And the, but I don't know how to do that very easily because it's never clear how to uh, assign credit to the problems you've generated. Like individually, you've generated a bunch of problems, then you have to fine tune. It's just such a big loop that it's hard to figure out uh, which curriculum, you know, if you're trying to design a curriculum to learn, you're trying to get good at solving problems. What's a good problem? How do you figure out which one is helpful? Yeah, like you, you want the program to be hard to solve, but not trivial either. So. Yeah, do you want to focus on the things that you solve one in a hundred times? That may be your first thing. Or do you want to solve on the, focus on the easy problems that you should solve 99% of the time, but you only solve 10% of the time? It's not clear. Uh, which one? Value of a data point and Shapley value. If you yeah, do exactly. Like that, <laughs> right. Vince? Is there a version of this problem where you get a big penalty for submitting a wrong solution, and how well can you do with that? That'd be good. Um, that's a great question. GPT 4, its pass at one rate, which is the first try pass rate, is way higher than the other models. And I think by playing, and that's maybe what uh, Kevin was saying as well, like by playing with the utility function, yeah, you could encourage it to uh, try to improve its pass at one rate. You could also offer it an option to not submit a solution and see if it can then know when it actually knows and when it doesn't. That'd be interesting, right? Yeah. Okay, last question. Okay. Yeah. Was runtime the only like main criteria? Like do you care about like memory usage and other sort of efficiency? Great um, question. No, we we just had a hard in the first part of the talk, we have a hard threshold for runtime. In the second part of the talk, we um, you could use an arbitrary utility there that if you can measure the uh, <laughs> memory usage and everything, then you could potentially factor that into the utility. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you.